Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of The War Report. Don't worry, we did not forget about you, we did not abandon you this week. And we have plenty of stories to sift through, following up on a lot of what we had last week. And really, just to start, a lot of the big news has been domestic, with the ongoing trials, and the biggest one, which will be decided tomorrow, on Monday, is the case of the kid from Kenosha, Kyle Rittenhouse himself, and it has been quite a journey through all this deliberation, watching these court <laughs> proceedings. I'm no lawyer. I wouldn't be able to speak to this. I, I don't have the technical expertise for this, but just going through. Again, it just seemed to have been a series of the prosecution shooting itself in the foot as well as what some may be considered to be a sympathetic judge, or maybe this is just a neutral judge, and we're so used to, with the way things have played out, that he just looks sympathetic. But already, you can tell there's panic. They're talking about, oh, how he's going to walk, and how he's going to get off, and why the judge is biased, and this should be a mistrial, and we should start over, and blah, 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 and blah, blah, blah. Of course, at the end of the day, it is up to the jury. But... Just in terms of the politicization of this case, which was inevitable, the big thing that they're hitting the judge on is apparently he's made like several like non-related comments, but the biggest one that stuck out to me is they were trying to get him. Now, he had his cell phone go off accidentally in court <laughs> twice. And they were saying like, well, you know, his ringtone, it was a song of the far right. It was a song of Trumpism. And I think it, I think I think it's it, it's just God bless America, which again is like yeah. Um, it, but the reason I bring this up is it shows an interesting development, which we've documented for a while in American politics, where the idea of the American nation of an American people, even like down to civic nationalism, even down to like what like your boomer conservative believes America is, like oh it's just an idea where we all believe in freedom, democracy, and capitalism. Of course, to the more concrete stuff like, oh, yes, we're a country, you know, of Anglo Saxon settlers who built this because of our language, culture, and religion, regardless. But point being is even the most mild form of American patriotism has been written off as something that is partisan, which is something we've documented for a long time. Again, mm -hmm. also with the references of how it seems like internationally the rainbow flag has become the symbol that replaces the American flag as the banner of the empire, as you see the embassies wanting to fly that, and the U.S. military, again, delivering those questions like, should people be able to display those if they're in the military, blah, blah, blah. But again, the reason I bring that point in particular up is it just shows, it's probably the most blatant example I've seen of the idea that American national identity is now a right-wing virtue. And again, this exists to an extent in other countries where you have like a more globalistic quote unquote left wing that goes forward with that, that shirks national identity more. But even in some other Western countries that are afflicted by this, I can't think of another country, maybe Canada, to the degree where identifying with the national identity is considered a politically partisan virtue. I mean, oddly enough, uh, the Canadian flag here is not as maligned or associated with the right wing <laughs> because there is virtually no right wing here. Uh, whereas I think the, the American flag post 60s, you know, culture war 1.0 uh, has been a symbol of um, well, it was a symbol of empire. Uh, but as you say, there's a new symbol of empire now. And um it has uh, moved from symbol of empire to symbol of, uh, I, I don't know, some kind of code for uh, um, the, you know, the, the, the Confederate flag or uh, for right wing uh, resistance, even uh, for racism, uh, colonialism, whatever. Right. So um, mainly because Canada you know, redesigned its flag back, I think it was 69 or 70. Um, previously, our flag, you know, had a large red field with a Union Jack in the upper left-hand corner and um, a leaf emblem in, in the, more or less in the center area of the flag. So it looked kind of like a red version of the Australian flag in some ways. 
uh, I think that pl probably played a role. Uh, I think the cultural revolution that was taking here as well, uh, Canada kind of preempted that, right? But that, you know, but the, the gay flag, of course, is the empire flag that we fly here as well. Uh, every police station in the country, every school in the country, every university in the country, all the major institutions fly it. It's um, it's saturated. Oh, certainly. It is one of those things where, again, they're trying to usher that in because they've written off, as you were saying, the American flag proper is a right-wing symbol. Now, it's become more and more explicit over the years to the point where, I mean, you can still go places like in, you know, blue America, like, you know, some suburbs, where, like, you'll, you'll see, of course, like, you know, like, flag flying, flag waving has been a thing that other countries raise an eyebrow at America for, of course, with the, you know, world wars and the Cold War, and especially after 9-11, we got a revival. This idea of, like, you know, national solidarity, national unity around the banner, which makes sense when you think about it logically, has been something they raise the eyebrow at. But you can tell year after year in those kind of places, the stars and stripes are replaced by the... Uh, rainbow banner which again isn't really a surprise but this isn't too related to the trial but i just wanted to put that out there but again as somebody who's not a legal expert it does i say look pretty good for him now there has been like the threats of violence against the jury or the threats that we're going to start rioting if we don't get the result we want and again with all that it it looks like despite all of that, the things are going in his direction. Because if I'm correct about Wisconsin law, it does have to be a unanimous jury. I think most states have to have a unanimous jury. So even if there's a few dissenters, he'll be acquitted. He'll walk. And they won't be able to charge him on anything or sentence him on anything related to that. And with that being said, again, I think this case stands so much to set a precedent with, okay, number one, all the lies about it, like, oh, he took his rifle across state lines when, and he went to this community he had no connection to, when they pointed out that his father, his aunt and uncle, his grandparents had all lived in Kenosha, and the, and of course it's come out, like, at the beginning of the trial, and even before then, that, yeah, the firearm he used was provided to him at that time, where the worst thing they can really get him with is being underage with a firearm like that, which, again, I don't even know how they would pull that off, and again, if I had to make a personal prediction, I think he's going to get off scot-free. I think it's going to be one of those cases where they just can't deny the evidence in front of them that he is clearly not guilty of this, and there's nothing we can really pin him on. Um, as much as I think they would like to, that just doesn't exist. And I think it's also important because it sets a precedent going forward as the culture war becomes hotter, because, I mean, that's admittedly what Kenosha was. It was a culture war that escalated into riots that escalated into this confrontation. It was a culture war that turned into a hot war. And with that, if Kyle does walk or get a slap on the wrist, you see liberals already fear-mongering about this. Like, oh, what if this spawns more? What if we have, you know, a, a, a Republicans just walk up and do this to liberals? But I think in a serious sense, the idea that's established, well, you can stand up to these mobs and there's a chance that the court might see your point of view and say, you didn't do anything wrong. I'm not saying it'll inspire like some mass movement, especially considering the fact that the riots have mostly died down. But it will put a hard limit on what rioters can do, because there's always the chance of another Kyle coming out and doing the job that the authorities won't. And having a court system that may get them off for it, and they won't be actively punished. Now, on the other hand, you have that one shop owner in Texas who did the same thing, was dragged through the mud, eventually ended up offing himself tragically. But, again, I suppose that's a, that's a tale of two cases with that. But I'm just saying, I think there's potential for a good outcome here to reaffirm that you do have a right to use force in the face of a violent mob, if need be. And I think that will be the big thing determined going forward, and that will be possibly, if this sort of trend continues, if there are more 
riots by Antifa, by Black Lives Matter, if we do ever get into one of these cycles again, which we do have a congressional election coming up, a midterm election, which isn't as much. Maybe this will apply further down the road in 2024 as things turn out that way or whatever instant they try to drum up. But point being is I think the state weapon of proxy riots that were utilized throughout 2020, if Kyle does get off, a hard limit has been put to those. And one could argue that a hard limit was put to those in 2020 because he did show up and show that, yeah, there's people out there willing to push back out against this and protect themselves and their communities. And I would say, of course, it didn't stop all the rioting in 2020. It certainly put a hard limit to it. I would say we're looking at a situation where it potentially puts another hard limit on this new tactic they've employed on us. Yeah, I mean, I think the uh, to, to take the contrarian point of view, I think the other uh, the other things that can develop out of this is uh, new laws uh, to limit juries by race um, that could be introduced. Um, a purge of uh, judges, perhaps um, in, in certain states, uh, it could be. I think it will most definitely become a campaign slogan at the very least uh, for the midterms and for uh, the 2024 election uh, about what we have to do, you know, about um, guys like Kyle, because, you know, Biden did call him a white supremacist. Um, Now, the other thing is that uh, the news media, of course, is already stating that this should be just called a mistrial and uh, a new trial should begin as swiftly as possible. What you also see is the mindset of of, of the progressives and, and the liberals, right? What I mean by this is um, they have a concept of the greater, you know, the greater justice, the justice that is not yet codified in law and uh, that's why the riots are actually a good thing, because they were addressing clumsy as they were, uh, deadly as they were, and violent as they were. Um, they address uh, a, a greater scale of injustice. So today's laws are woefully inadequate, and this is the defeat of a little and uh, arcane law uh, challenging the progress of justice. That, I think, is a, a narrative that already exists. I think it's going to be uh, clarified into greater detail for various election campaigns. Uh, they're going to, if Kyle gets off, they're, they're going to go ballistic. Oh, certainly. Uh, I think you brought up a point with the purging of judges that this case, I do think, shined a light on the fact, at least for the regime, that there are still people dedicated to the old, you could say, constitutional order. Maybe that's even stretching a bit. But people who, uh, judges, uh, people within the legal system, who aren't fully on board the program, who aren't fully on board the fact that we are an ideologically liberal state, even if that violates the Constitution, even that violates other so-called liberal principles, that this is the program, this is what we do to political prisoners, don't like it, get out. And I think it's shined a light on the fact that, you know, this case should have been a shoe in for them. It should have been, this should have been a proper show trial for the regime with the way everything went, especially with a Biden victory. And it looks like they didn't get that. And one could argue mainly because of number one, I would say the judge and number two, the incompetent prosecution, because as much as the judge has been sympathetic, the prosecution has also been like dog shit and making its argument, at least with my um, very limited understanding of legal proceedings, but with that, I think it could, um, you bring up a great point that, yeah, it might lead to a cleaning of house within the justice system to make sure that people like that prosecutor and that judge aren't tasked with these sort of cases from now on. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I do think that uh, could be an inevitability. I, I certainly think that, um, in blue states uh, is where the process will, where it'll probably begin. And I, I just see that this is going to be like a campaign promise, right? For courts to, ne- this will be considered systemic racism. 
um, or um, a systemic problem of uh, latent white nationalism within the uh, judiciary, with, within the courts. So, uh, you know, I, I will wait and see. Um, this, you know, we, we don't know, but we'll, we'll find out very soon. I think as the campaigns for the midterms begin, we're going to hear more of this rhetoric in 2022. And I can't see them letting go of this in 2024. This will be uh, uh, one of those divisive uh, and decisive issues. Um, because, I, I mean, it doesn't matter the preponderance of evidence or how their main witness uh, completely, I mean, he you could say he completely goofed up, but he really did the, the he did the best lying he could under the circumstances. That is, there is so much video evidence of what he did that I remember in one question period, he was asked, um, uh, did you pursue the suspect? And he says, no, but you ran after him. And he says, I was just running. <laughs> like, or I was running kind of toward him. Uh, did you have your gun with you? Uh, I did. Um, were you in intending to use it? No. Uh, but then the crescendo was, did you take out your gun? And of course, there is the video picture, the moment that his arm is blowing up and this, also the arm holding onto the gun. And um, it, you, you just can't deny that. This thing just has so much video evidence that you really will have to come up with a kind of law, again, very broad and general, but enforceable about how we can't allow these small details get in the way of uh, of progress, right? Like America is in a, like internally America is in very big trouble. And we've mentioned it before on the show. So like when you're listening to CNN exaggerate the effects of January the 6th, it's not really hysteria. I mean, yeah, you could call it hysteria if you want to, but the hysteria has a purpose. It's really, they're being proactive uh, about how something like this could take place again. And maybe they will be successful or, or maybe they won't just want to like gawk at the paintings and sculptures inside the Capitol building and just scare everybody a little bit. And, you know, maybe it'll be something different. So th they are afraid of that, right? And th the case with Kyle is unique in that um, it's one of the few cases where the rioters died <laughs> instead of the other way around. <laughs> so they're very, very upset about that. They like, again, and it comes uh, again, back down to this idea that you have to understand the progress of the greater justice, the justice that is not yet codified in, in law, but soon should be. And that, um, the you know, the it's a minor detail that, uh, that the Kyle Rittenhouse uh, did this. No one should have uh, protected their property, uh, uh, you know, uh, because the, the riots were righteous. They were essentially a good thing, as violent as they were. Uh, you know, libs and pro uh, progressives have a definite vision of the future, right? And they want to get there. And they're not going to get there with like these little laws and inconveniences. That said, um, the video evidence is overwhelming. Uh, Kyle, of course, everybody knows, is running away. Uh, the evidence even for Rosenbaum, he has gunfire uh, to prove that he did grab the nozzle of uh, Kyle's gun. Um, There's just a preponderance of evidence and it it, it, it can't be denied. and. For them to fully succeed, they would have to bring in something. This is why I think the case is going to be so egregious for them if it doesn't go this their way. Because if Kyle does get thrown in jail, and I'm sure they would want like two life sentences, um, that will produce the chilling effect that they need 
so that when there are more riots in the future, there, there will be even less resistance. It, it's, you know what I mean? It, um, only in their eyes, only there's only one position of power that can be occupied, and there are two parties who want it. So if they lose, uh, that will embolden them, that will embolden resistance against uh, you know, the local globalists, uh, the various minorities with their uh, single issue, you know, voting concerns. Um, th that's what will happen, right? If, if uh, of course, if they win, then it takes care of a whole uh, mountain of evidence that, uh, sorry, mountain of effort that would have to be thrown in uh, to, to change the course of events. So uh, it says, I, I guess, essentially this means a lot of hard work for them lies ahead if Kyle wins. Um, I, I mean, I'm curious about the media and all of this because the media right now is is even more like CNN and MSNBC and so on. They're more jingoistic for progressivism and globalism than they've ever been. I mean, they they're even outdoing Fox and. Um, in the process, though, what that's doing is it's further going to polarize the society and it's going to reveal what their what their real agenda is. Um, I think there's some within their ranks that are concerned about this, right? Because one of the things you've started to notice, especially as Biden's popularity has been falling, is the amount of down votes, not just at the White House YouTube channel, but at CNN. Um, there are still, you know, uh, videos that they will put up that are like 1.5 thousand for versus 185 against. That's true. That does happen. But there are others that are very close, neck and neck, or the down votes are higher. And I haven't seen that kind of thing since 2016 and 17. Um, and this is, of course, why YouTube this week announced that it will get rid of the down vote, right? Which, of course, um, we support our corporate overlords fully in their endeavors. We love the platform <laughs> that they provide with us. And I think what they're doing is actually a great move to stop uh, cyber harassment. But you do bring up a lot it's of... It's really about our well-being. Oh, certainly, uh, certainly. Especially for us smaller channels. Yeah this, is, yeah. this is really to protect us, okay? So from this point onward, your criticism means nothing to me. <laughs> but with all that being said, yeah, um, th uh, th therapists aren't cheap, you know. Oh yeah, yeah. Like you know, it's the the emotional labor I do for you people and the way you treat me. But <laughs> <laughs> but, but to dis but to dispel with all of that, getting into what you're saying about yeah, this is going to be a panic mode for the regime if this does come to fruition and again not only that on top of everything else on top of the you know what mandates on top of the charlottesville trial on top of biden's plummeting popularity but one other thing i wanted to mention as you were saying with midterms one thing i think a lot of people forget and i don't know about this particular judge but a lot of judicial positions in this country even on a statewide level are still determined by the ballot are still elected officials Whereas some states and some positions are appointed judges, a lot of judges, it does come down to popular vote. Uh, whoever, you know, mm -hmm. wins that state or wins that locality is the judge for the next whatever given term there is. So uh, that's another thing where you could see this red state, blue state division. Because, of course, th this creates a whole new campaign issue where, you know, you get a uh, red state, uh, you know, Republican guy running for judge saying... Well, of course, I will uphold your rights to self-defense and the, the Second Amendment. And then, of course, you get a uh, you know, blue state Democrat judge saying, well, we need to counter this white supremacy and we need to uh, counter the systemic racism in the justice system that gets people like Kyle Rittenhouse off. Like, again, it's uh, that is yet another thing you can put in to show the real disillusion, continuing disillusion of unity within the United States. And again, just adding the electoral angle into that or... Of course, politicians with the authorities to appoint judges, um, one may think the president and the Supreme Court, but even, you know, like governors in terms of state level positions and localities. Again, with that, you also have, I mean, they've always campaigned on that since about, what, the past 70 years, but 
this adds a whole new dimension to it. Oh, I'll appoint judges who will, you know, uh, fight back against systemic racism or fight for your right to... Again, these are all, like, cliches that they've thrown out there before, but after this case, especially if it goes the way I think it's going to, it gives those talking points a much realer meaning than they've ever had. And with all of that being combined, that will make for an even more contentious uh, midterm, probably the most contentious midterm election we've had in quite some time, in 2022, and if Virginia is a gauge for anything, we're seeing some minor level of pushback against that. Again, not that I think Youngkin is going to be this great uh, right-wing hero or this great populist hero or anything like that, but you know what these people represent symbolically, it it's, is taking a pulse of the American population. That is about the only good thing about democracy is you get a direct pulse on the population saying, well, okay, this is what they think, blah, 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 and with that, again, 2022 primaries are in a few months. Uh, the 2022 elections are in about a year or so. That just opens up a whole new dimension in this... I, I don't even think culture war does whatever this is just anymore. In this uh, civil... like, which I, I mean, there's really no better term for, than it for culture war, even though, again, I don't think it does just... In this uh, so-called culture war then, again, what these elections are going to be and the kind of people who are going to, you know, take the ballot. And, of course, after 2022, we'll start to get an idea of what Republican hopefuls uh, plan on challenging Biden or maybe at that point Kamala Harris. So it really... This one case has the potential for a lot of ripple effect that I don't think anyone would, would have even expected all the way back in 2020. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's fascinating actually. Uh, I I didn't know what would come of it. I just kept in my mind the the amount of evidence. Um, really, their only argument, and, and it, I'm surprised the prosecutors haven't come up with an argument about how, um, you know, how him resisting was in and of itself a mistake. Um, there for for the most part. Uh, especially when they are questioning uh, the um, the witnesses, uh, the underlying uh, presumption is that um, uh, you know did Kyle have or not have the right to defend himself in this situation, uh, or, or was it excessive or not? Right, like it. I, I mean, that's that's the nature of the the, the current judicial system, right? That is how it works. It ba it's based on a certain set of laws that, uh, I mean, I agree with, don't get me wrong, uh, but, but they, they haven't been able to change them. And um, so they're kind of in the frame, they're, they're, being, they're framing themselves within the frame that best suits Kyle. And again, I think if, uh, you know, if nobody had been there, if none of this was videotaped, all of this would have gone very, very, very differently, extremely differently. None of this would be uh, would be happening. Kyle would be locked up, no question. Uh, but you know, uh, we live in this uh, you know uh, social media age, and everything is recorded. Everyone has almost virtually everyone has a, a fairly good camera on them all the time now, and it's backfired, right? And I think that's what. What hurts the most for them? Oh, certainly. Again, this is one of those things that, one of those rare moments that will get egg on their face. I would say, um, and of course, well, it'll all be determined by tomorrow, by whatever the ruling is on Monday, that this has as much potential as Trump's victory in 2016 did for the amount of outrage it will cause from the regime and the regime loyalists in terms of... I, I, like, I think, again, yeah, we're looking, maybe not quite, but at comparable to Trump levels if this kid gets out yeah. of the situation, which I think he has a very realistic chance of doing. I would say I, I would actually uh, give him a pretty good chance based on the uh, people who are more knowledgeable than law that I've heard talk about this and have talked to about this. Um, they say it looks uh, pretty good for him. Uh, now, again, we could be throwing a curveball. He could be made an example of. 
but even if he if he does get sentenced, I don't know how Wisconsin law would work with the what kind of sentence they have to give him. There's potential for the judge to also make this a sentence that isn't really a sentence, as judges do have the capability of doing a lot. So, again, unless the judge does a 180 and uh, this kid gets found guilty, I think this has a lot of potential to be one of those events that just causes amounts of outrage again we haven't seen in about five years mm-hmm. at least. Yeah, I think you're uh, you're right about that. Uh, um, you know, they, they will be extremely, extremely disappointed. Um, I, I can't see uh, how there won't be a riot. Uh, I know I, I I thought that uh, the governor has asked for some uh, some guard troops to show up. Um, so, I mean, they're expecting it. Um, I, I guess we'll we'll all find out tomorrow. Uh, yeah, I, I don't have anything really f- further to say except that it was uh, immensely gratifying to see their their witness <laughs> disappoint the judges and this. It, it, I mean, uh, you know, disappoint his lawyers. Sorry, uh, the the judge. I thought I agree with you. Uh, he's 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 quite neutral, uh, and that's why it feels like. Uh, a fascist takeover. <laughs> uh, oh, but really, there's there's no getting around this. You can't make the argument that yes, they were pursuing him. Yeah, uh, but um, r- racial injustice is a bigger problem than Kyle Rittenhouse. Yeah, but look at uh, this grainy life. photo blown up a thousand times. This clearly proves that he aimed the gun first. That he initiated the confrontation, which was. A, a deliberation they had for about 25 minutes in that courtroom before the judge pretty much told the prosecutor to shut up, which happened on multiple occasions. Um, yes. And, yes. You know, and this is from a defense team that apparently wasn't even that good. But I mean, with all that being said, I'm I'm uncharacteristically optimistic about the outcome of this. But let's move on to the much more meme-worthy trial, as, as I know you've been keeping up with uh, this as a you know every moment sort of thing, and. Uh, so, how's it looking for the uh, for the boys in the Charlottesville trial? Uh, I mean, I'll be honest. I, I haven't actually uh, kept track of it as as much. Uh, it, it has been an unusual week for me, and that's partly why uh, we've um, been unable to do the show. Uh, what I do know is, you know, there is no, uh, you know, from, from what I've followed so far, there is no. Like, there's no real criminal offense here. That has already been decided. Essentially, th- this trial is basically to um, impoverish uh, all the defendants. That's that's what it's there for. Uh, they have to prove that there, were, there was a, a right-wing conspiracy to cause mass violence uh, at Charlottesville. And they're having a difficult time proving that because the video evidence actually shows uh, the, the counter protesters with with weapons attacking them as they try to join their comrades at the Robert E. Lee statue. Um, so far, it, it does like I mean, that is a trial that I do think that they could possibly uh, um, rule guilty. Um, it's not nearly as cut and dry as uh, Rittenhouse. Of course, I pers- they have not presented persuadable evidence to indicate that, um, you know, beyond jokes that they were there to cause violence or that the counter protesters weren't there to do the same. Uh, so, I, I, I mean, it's a, the, the charge is more vague, okay? And the video evidence also isn't strong, but it, there isn't a preponderance of it in the same way that there is for Kyle. And, you know, for Kyle, you know, the defense isn't able to prove that there was a conspiracy for him to go and uh, cause violence at, at Kenosha. Because Kenosha had already been rioting for at least two days at this point. Right. Arson had already been going on. Um, 
and there's a particular exchange that he uh, that he had with Kyle. Kyle, the the prosecutor Binger or whatever his name is, uh, asked, "Why did you why did you get a GPS of the place you were going to defend?" And he said, "So I could give." coordinates so I could get coordinates on how to get there but don't you didn't you go to Kenosha didn't you work there and he says yeah but the all the roads were blocked I needed to find a back way to to get there and he says why were the roads blocked was there construction <laughs> was there construction like the roads were blocked for two days because they've been rioting in arson not because like and he knows that right he knows that um, you can understand why the judge has lost patience with the prosecution so many times. Uh, it, it, it's, uh, it's ridiculous. I just think they, um, also the way Kaplan, the, the prosecutors against, uh, Charlottesville defendants, like they have a, a broader picture here. Like they didn't have to do this, right? I think it's cost her something like 10 million or 15 million. And you have people that like, were never hurt, never got even in the thick of the action, uh, who said that they were traumatized or they were already traumatized by Trump's election, but they went to this anyways, right? Uh, one of them claimed that uh, she couldn't read, but she could read to study for her law exams. It's just like, all of this is so preposterous, right? It makes, it, it makes no sense, but, as I say, Kaplan, I think, has lots of wealthy people who understand that, you know, in 2017, uh, Spencer was the de facto, if uh, unofficial leader of the, the right wing in America. You know, uh, yeah, he, I mean, that's yes, a, he was the unofficial face of accepted. the of, of the so-called alt right, which is something that they spent about three or four years fear-mongering from about, like, 2014, 2015, up until, up until about Charlottesville and the immediate aftermath of, and, of course, Spencer was always one of the names that was name-dropped, because he would, you know, love him or hate him, he was one of the few people who actually put his real name and face out there, and uh, tried yeah. to present himself as a figure who isn't just uh, a guy who makes YouTube videos or podcasts, and again, not that there's anything wrong with the latter, but again, uh, of course, somebody like that is going to get more attention than you know, somebody who goes by right. a ridiculous pseudonym and, and does a podcast that gets, uh, you know, a, a couple hundred views online. Oh, who could that be? Um, could that be describing anyone in particular? Mm -hmm. uh, certainly, <laughs> uh, certainly not this humble little operation you're listening to right now, but <laughs> that's, that's all aside. Right. So, so the Charlottesville case represents the broader picture. Kyle fits into this picture, but the broader picture is with uh, with Spencer, the alt right, and particularly Charlottesville is the kind of the, the centrifugal to all of this, right? It's where everything came to um, a kind of a crescendo, right? Everything that they warned against, right? But I mean, they ignore uh, shortly after Trump's election how people were beaten up by the leftists um, at a night rally in Stanford University, for instance. A lot of people saw that and they were outraged and. They saw elderly people getting uh, beaten up in the daytime at Stanford University. And then, you know, we had Stickman appear. And so there was a pushback against it. But the, the, the fact is, that it, the violence did start with them because their utter disappointment that uh, Trump would get elected. And um, so, yeah, this is, this is the, the big picture trial going on, right? If they can get them on, uh, on these more vague charges, on evidence that's harder to prove, that will give them a kind of the the kind of chilling effect that they want. Now, a lot of this is just the water already under the bridge, and it's not because it, it, you know uh, Fields has already been found guilty and is serving over four hundred years in prison. Um, uh, that isn't the point of this, anyways. But um, it, it, its its primary purpose is is there to signal to the population about when they, for instance, examine themselves where they stand politically of, uh, you know, how strong the system, how robust is it against uh, the right wing? Because essentially the right wing in Western countries and in America in particular, um, you know, and part of its uh, quote unquote denazification program post-World War II 
is there to make the right wing essentially illegal, right? Um, so that's the broader picture. And um, Kyle can be looked at as, you know, someone who isn't technically an adult and got swept up in it and uh, under also very different circumstances. But the broader picture belongs with the, the outbreak in Charlottesville. I would say the primary lesson to take away from both these cases, especially the Kenosha case, is, you know, unless push really comes to shove, and I don't know his exact circumstance, but I can say this almost definitively for everyone who went to the Charlottesville debacle, being a hero is certainly not worth it. Again, throwing yourself into this is not worth it. Now, again, we may get a good outcome, for example, if this uh, trial and, you know, with the Kenosha debacle does turn out well, if it does turn out like what I was talking about at the beginning of the show, that might be something. But in general, again, I will once again advise you not to do this, these sort of things. Not to, because, look, you know, there's a time to stand up for yourself. There's a time to assert what you believe is right. But putting yourself out in these situations is just simply not going to end well for you. Nine times out of ten, probably even narrower odds than that. But with all that being said... That is all I had for the domestic news. Uh, now I have a few other worldwide stories. If you'd like to get into those now, uh, I have yeah, sure. uh, a, a bit of Middle Eastern news. So we did touch on this briefly, but it is confirmed that the American embassy in Yemen has been taken over by Houthi rebels. All, that coincides as Saudi Arabia starts to pull back the war effort even more so than it was before. So. It looks like Yemen is coming to about as a swift conclusion as the conflict in Afghanistan did with a... Uh, may, maybe I exaggerate, but with the Houthis emulating the Taliban in the sense that it seems like they're seizing a quick victory with very little to no resistance. And perhaps this embassy thing is another 1979 Tehran where behind-the-scenes forces are orchestrating a crisis in order for X figure to solve it and look like a hero, because, of course, the Iranian hostage crisis was engineered for Reagan and, you know, with uh, George H.W. Bush in the background to look like a hero compared to Carter. Of course, it was in 79, the year before the election. Reagan can come in, be the strong, tough guy up against the weak and impotent Carter. Now, it doesn't look like there's been the setup for that. I haven't seen enough yet for that to be the case. But it does show the fact that, again, another American embassy, just three months ago we had one under siege and being evacuated. Mm -hmm. um, we had the attacks on the Iraqi embassy just since beginning 2020. There's been periodic missile attacks. But, again, the fact that yet another embassy, which... Embassies in yep. these sort of countries can be understood as, like, forward operating bases, that pretty much like um, governor's palaces, if you will, in terms of these countries that we're trying to micromanage. The fact that yet another one has fallen into the hands of a group like the Houthis is yet another blemish on the record of the American Empire. Now, of course, it doesn't carry the weight of a conflict like Afghanistan, which we fought for 20 years over the September 11th attacks, which were much more ingrained in the minds of the American public. Plenty of Americans wouldn't even know that we were in any sort of military engagement with Yemen. So, I doubt this will hold the same weight as, for example, the Afghanistan debacle or even the Iraq debacles. But it is, at least on the international stage, at least for the people who pay attention, yet another blow to the American Empire's credibility. That you can't even protect your own embassy. That even if you can't protect your embassy, you can't even evacuate it. Oh, another example I forgot about. How could I forget about this one? It was beaten to death. Um... Benghazi was another one where we failed to protect an embassy in a country that we were on pretty hostile terms with and that had several militant groups prowling around it. So, let's see. That makes four with this one because you had Benghazi, yeah. you had Iraq, you had the, the Baghdad embassy, uh, you had the evacuation from Afghanistan, and Yemen makes four within the past decade. I'm sure there's probably other minor incidents I'm forgetting about, but still, four within less than a decade. Yeah, uh, I mean, it is remarkable. And you can kind of see now, uh, the first thing I thought about it, it was um, maybe the reason they went so hard. Uh, I mean, the reason they went really hard against um, 
Hillary uh, was partly because there was an election coming up and the Republicans wanted to take it because it didn't want to endure 12 years of Democrat rule. Uh, but the other is, I think, uh, the sheer embarrassment of them losing the embassy in Benghazi, right? Uh, the reason, of course, is they just had a successful campaign against Gaddafi, but in the broader context, they did not have such a good time in Georgia. They backed off from protecting Georgia against Russia. Uh, and, and this, uh, you know, this was a concern, that, uh, an emerging concern regarding Russia, that maybe Russia was back. And, um, and again, it, it, something like that had not happened for a long time. I don't know if there was something like that, uh, let's say, because, of course, uh, American personnel died in Benghazi as well. I mean, it wasn't like, uh, you know, nothing. And it was uh, suddenly restored and, you know, people were were shaken, but nobody died. Or it was just minor injuries. People died. Um, and in the last time I remember, uh, you know, this happening to an American embassy is, was uh, with Iran. I mean, there were others, of course. There was the, I believe there was a, a UN embassy. Uh, a, where there were Americans in Iraq after America invaded Iraq, but something of like a, a kind of like a one-to-one, -one, lack of a better term, one-to-one -one ratio where, you know, so America versus Iran, you know, the embassy, the hostages, and then uh, America versus these various uh, Libyan factions in Libya, you know, there are no other parties involved. So you could see that, you know, th this was an embarrassment and that, you know, maybe America's uh, preeminence was not fulfilling itself the way they had hoped. Um, the time that this had happened, people were sick of both the Iraq war and the Afghan war. And uh, a lot of people were wondering whether it was wise to kill Qaddafi and throw Libya into a hellhole. In fact, that was what most people were saying anyways. Even the media wasn't all that kind um, uh, to Obama. Not in the same way they are kind and very protective of Biden. So, And that was also another Atlantic schism where, of course, even though the French were very pro-intervention in Libya, right. a lot of European countries... Um, you, you think Italy, I think even Germany at that point had denounced it. The British went along with it, but I, I remember Italy and Germany in particular were very against the idea of going into Libya. And I think there was actually some conflict of, of between the Italian government and the American government about the use of American airfields in Italy to strike Libya. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. That, that was one of the, the issues. So yeah, you know, um, it it didn't it didn't uh, it didn't end well, but you could see that uh, what they were mostly uh, concerned about is 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 this going to be a sign of weakness, right? Because three years earlier, Russia just steamrolls into Tbilisi. Uh, they make good on their promise that they're going to do that. There's going to be consequences. You have to wonder that in you know in the background, uh, they you know they are thinking like. Shit, we have to, you know, we're, we, we, we've got our Soros based project in in, uh, in Ukraine, you know, uh, what, you know, what do we do? Uh, so, yeah, uh, a sign of weakness um, is, is uh, I guess, the, the bottom line, but also it coincides with the election. Uh, you know, they wanted their one of their guys in there. Um, because a, a party that, you know, that loses two elections, but three is just, uh, at, at that point, a party has to really redefine itself, right? That's essentially what Bill Clinton did after 12 years of Le Reagan, uh, Reagan and Bush. Uh, he was literally, like people commented even back then about he, how he was like a, a third way, a, com a combination of Republican and Democrat um, uh, values or um, priorities. Wait, wait, happened. you're telling me there was a, Bill Clinton was a Nosbull? <laughs> yes, yes he, was, he was a Nosbull. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Republican on the streets, Democrat in the sheets. You know, that kind of <laughs> oh, wonderful.
awful wonderful. Uh, yeah, but yeah. <laughs> I suppose that being said, we could cover some Syria news because there's quite a bit brewing in Syria. Now, the main piece of news is it's more or less confirmed that the S-300s are operating in Syria as active air defenses. You had news out of northeastern Syria and the Kurdish-controlled regions with Russians moving more assets into the airfield that took over there and Syrian regular Syrian forces actually blocking American convoys from operating in their zone that they've been operating in for the past several years. You have the conflict zone around Idlib. Again, that's still hot as ever with pro-government forces backed by Russia pushing further in. You've had some re- more resistance from the opposition forces from the militants in Idlib who, again, of course they are counter-striking, but it does seem like they, they're they putting up their last-ditch fight, let's put it that way. You have these pockets of ISIS resurgence where they'll commit these small attacks and get involved in these skirmishes. And you had an instant where let's, uh, it was a daughter of one of the Kurdish uh, groups, one of the groups under the control of the Kurdish areas, um, had a 14-year-old girl who's the daughter of, again, one of these uh, high-ranking Kurdish officials uh, get killed in a fire fright. So things are picking up along the Euphrates yet again, uh, involving both I, involving ISIS, the Syrian forces, and the SDF forces. But again, the biggest news at the end of the day is uh, Idlib and as well as the missile defenses being operational in Syria now with the S-300s. And overall, things are just going along as they usually have. It's escalated slightly since we covered it last week, but things are going on generally the same trajectory that we've expected, and really... One could say, this is what a Syria absent American influence looks like. Because, again, I know you still have American forces in the country, you still have American presence in the region, but they've taken more or less a hands-off approach. In fact, this con- American convoy getting blocked is the first news I've heard involving American forces in Syria since we launched those strikes back in February. The first significant news, I should say. There's mm-hmm. been minor stories here and there. But really, you could say they're really making up for this by these ISIS resurgences with these very small pockets of attacks and skirmishes taking place. But at the end of the day, again, it looks like I have to keep reiterating because I'm certain of this prediction. We witnessed the last summer of Idlib in this year, 2021, and that the Idlib province under opposition forces control will be no more before the start of next summer, before next June, I would say. And I'm holding to that, and that only seems to be the case going forward. I think as that starts to happen, I think as we enter in the beginning of 2022, as things are cleaned up, probably some point in the spring, we'll see a lot more focus on northeastern Syria with the diplomatic situation there. We'll see, depending on what American influence does with the country, depending on how much they try to defend the quote-unquote SDF forces, how quick they are to come to the table, and how aggressive Turkey will be regarding this. And, you know, even with that, you had a showdown. It wasn't exactly a firefight, but it was a showdown between Syrian and Turkish forces on the border. So, Mm -hmm. uh, yet again, Uh, uh, Syria continues to heat up in the same direction it's been going. And just little by little, um, it's something to keep your eye on. And it looks like, despite what... You know, you may have thought seven years ago, it, it is wild to look at the time lapse on this, that I know we've said it before, but I, I think it's definitive that Assad has won this war, and I don't really know any other way to p- put it, and I feel the need to reiterate it every time we talk about the Syrian conflict. Right. Uh, the other thing, uh, talk about getting more emboldened, not just, uh, you know, we haven't seen this in a while, as you said, uh, Syrian troops are pushing back against American troops. American troops are withdrawing. Um, 
American troops have apparently killed uh, another ISIS commander in in Greater Idlib. I, I will say that um, maybe that implies that there is some cooperation on some level, though in a very limited way. But the area, the other area where you're seeing some boldness from the Syrians is they're starting to encroach around Afrin, which is under Turkish control. But there are various groups, both Arab and Kurdish, that are against their control of the city. Uh, furthermore, uh, Russia is continuing to bomb. Um, I have not seen too many attacks in Deir Azor in central Syria and locales around there of ISIS mounted attacks. Um, so far, uh, there are not any new attacks emanating from the south where the recent peace deal uh, with the Russians and, and the Syrians was made. Uh, and you're seeing, I think, maybe what's most encouraging of all is the infighting taking place between various factions like HTS against other factions in Greater Idlib and the uh, jihadist or terrorist controlled area of Idlib. And uh, what that means is they're, they're low on funds. They're fighting for funds. They're fighting for control. This is a little fiefdom, and they, you know, there's several different warlords that want this fiefdom because there's not enough money. Yeah, so there, you know, this fiefdom is uh, is falling apart, and uh, there just isn't enough resources uh, for them to get along. Um, and it looks like it it's it is coming to a close. Um, yeah, th those are uh, my observations in Syria this week. I don't have really anything more to add to that that I hadn't already said at the beginning of this. But yet again, Syria, despite the fact that with how calm it may be, there's still plenty to cover in that conflict to the point where it warrants a segment over almost every show. And I'm remiss some weeks when we were actually able to skip Syria in favor of other news, but just other Middle Eastern news I will cover briefly, and before we get into some of the European stuff, is that Iranian helicopters made passes at American aircraft carriers in the Persian Gulf, so the Iranians are getting a bit more bold with their actions. It looks like we're returning to a normalcy. Of course, this is after the tanker showdown last week, where the Iranian tanker was taken by American forces, which was later retaken by Iranian forces, so... It looks like, despite the fact that I do personally believe the chapter of a possibility of outright war with Iran has closed, you still do have these sort of games being played between the two sides. And also, the last thing I will say, which will bring us to our other part, is the Baghdad airport in Iraq has halted flights to Belarus in light of the recent border crisis that they are having with Poland. Now... Of course, with the border crisis with Poland, you have Lukashenko taking a page out of Erdogan's playbook and using migrants as a weapon, as leverage against with the Western powers threatening to send them westward. Now, Lukashenko has garnered a lot of condemnation for this. A lot of countries have rallied around Poland. It is interesting because you do have France coming out and taking a relatively pro-Russia stance by us by saying that, well, maybe if we weren't so antagonistic towards this, we wouldn't be in this situation, which is, again, yet another pivot by France trying to play up more to the side of Russia and trying to more or less court both Russia and Belarus with that sort of rhetoric. But it looks like Poland is on the front line of this. They've gotten support from these countries that have previously condemned and scoffed at them. And once again, I said a lot of people are denouncing uh, Belarus for what they're doing, which I understand if you are European, especially if you are Polish, you don't want this happening, you don't care about this, you know, it comes down to your land, your sovereignty, and that, you know, the political disputes between this, you just seem to be the... Uh, again, and I do think it shows that, yet again, Poland is being treated as what it always has been viewed by as the European Union as the meat shield, as something that they can throw into the meat grinder if worse comes to pass. It's like, good thing Poland's holding the front line so we don't have to do it, which, 
again, while I understand the Poles supporting their border and protecting it from people trying to cross into the country that they do not want there, I, I think there seems to be a missed opportunity. And again, this is a relatively new incident. This has only been going on for a few weeks now. Maybe this would go on as time goes on. With the European Union that has mocked and scorned them and has punished them for trying to enforce their own sovereignty, perhaps they will see with the 180 with many European Union countries all of a sudden appreciating Polish sovereignty that that's all you are to them, that you are a meat shield, that you is simply the threat of Belarus and by greater extent Russia is the only reason we keep you in here and the only reason you're allowed to behave like this. And of course... The same thing has been happening with Lithuania, and the same treatment has been given to Lithuania to a lesser extent, but I think it is rich watching a lot of the Eurocrats complain about the situation when you look at this. <laughs> the only reason this tactic works is because the Eurocrats, Merkel, Germany, um, France, I would say France at least before Macron, but again... The people in charge of the European Union, the people who run the most powerful European countries, tolerated this from Turkey for the past few years now, since about 2017, 2018. They've tolerated these threats from Turkey. They've given Turkey concessions. They have given Erdogan what he wants, in some degree, not entirely. But they have showed leaders like Lukashenko that, hey, this tactic works. This is how you can extract what you want from us. And... Maybe, again, it's an oversight from Lukashenko. Maybe it's just a last-ditch gamble that, of course, Belarus isn't Turkey and doesn't have the same vital strategic interest that Turkey would hold for the European Union. But at the end of the day, you have this outrage, which, you know, on a surface level, again, I can understand, like, especially if you're Polish, if you're Lithuanian, if you're on the frontier of this crisis, yeah, I completely understand. You don't want these people in your country. I wouldn't want them in my country. But you have the people who actually do run the European Union who, and who are pretty much responsible for this crisis, if we're just being completely honest about this, showing that, well, we'll tolerate it from Turkey, it's okay when Erdogan does it, but we all of a sudden draw the line when they want to send migrants across the Polish border. And that's where we're going to stand up, which, again, it just looks so impotent that you've tolerated this mm -hmm. for years, you've tolerated mass migration for years, but the minute you get threatened by it from Belarus, and that's not even necessarily to justify their actions, you all of a sudden think mass migration is this problem, you all of a sudden think we need hard borders, and all of a sudden understand the Polish concern for sovereignty. So, really, as far as I'm concerned, there are no real, quote-unquote, good guys here, there really isn't any of these sort of situations, but the blanket condemnation of Lukashenko, again, from the people who have imported millions of migrants onto their own people, and also capitulated to Turkish demands when Turkey threatens to do the same thing as Belarus. This, something like this, maybe not in this exact form, but something akin to this was inevitable for the past several years now. It was only a matter of time for, and again, people are claiming that, of course, Putin is the orchestrator of all this. He told Lukashenko to do it. But also, Russia's afraid of losing Belarus, and again, these contradictory narratives, but it was inevitable that somebody like Lukashenko would come along and would realize, huh, maybe I should try this. And again, I would say the Europeans are in a lose-lose situation because they can either push further with this and, again, accelerate the process already taking place between Russia and Belarus, or they can capitulate to whatever Belarus' demands are and just make themselves look even more pathetic, having capitulated not only to Turkey, which Turkey is a more formidable country, country that actually has an imprint on the world stage, but capitulating to a state like Belarus. And again, at the end of the day, the biggest losers in this, uh, you know, and you can you know say what you will about them, are the you know just normal everyday Polish people. And the biggest morons out of all of this are the European leaders, because, again, this is a situation that they completely walk themselves in. Honestly, you have to give some credit to Lukashenko for strategic thinking, the fact that he was able to pretty much put them in checkmate insofar as this particular game is concerned. Well, you used uh, the word rich, and this whole fiasco is rich with 
all kinds of narratives, all kinds of subterfuge. Um, Lukashenko had reached an agreement with the EU regarding migrants prior to the 2020 election in August in Belarus. And when the color revolution essentially, that, and the thanks he got was a color revolution. Uh, and when that failed, the EU scrapped its border agreements with Belarus. Now, that was over a larger context of not recognizing Lukashenko as the legitimate president of Belarus. So there's a narrative here, and the narrative is Lukashenko wants to be taken seriously, and they're going to have to address him. Of course, they're refusing to address him and are instead going directly to, to Putin. Putin is, of course, you know, he's denying any culpability in all of this. And I don't think there is any culpability. No Russian airlines has been involved. This is a, an uh, this is an agreement between Turkey and Belarus. And in fact, um, as uh, the case is, let's say you're a Canadian and you want to go to to Belarus. Um, it's not like going to Russia. The visa is very lax as long as you enter the country in Minsk and leave the country in Minsk and you go back to the country that you came from. Right. So that's how the the migrants are getting around the issue of being like migrants or refugees. Right. A lot of these people paid thousands of dollars to do this. Uh, part of this is also the destabilization because these are mostly Iraqi Kurds and some Syrians. Uh, they help destabilize these countries in a direct way and it, 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 you know, following America. And it, this is a, on that level, this is a, a problem of their own making. But the immediate problem of their own making is them uh, resentfully scrapping the border agreement with Belarus. And then, you know, as you say, being hypocritical, uh, not treating Lukashenko the way they would uh, treat Erdogan. And might we also remind the audience that this past week, Britain accepted 1,000 migrants in one day. I believe it was Wednesday or Thursday. I can't remember. But that was 1,000 in one day. There are 4,000 at the border at the moment. This is not a significant number of people none of whom want to stay in Poland, right? November 15th, apparently there are buses that are going to arrive and ship them into Germany. But this is entirely the EU's fault. They, they have brought this upon themselves. Uh, uh, you know, uh, migrant crisis from, from Calais to, uh, uh, to uh, you know, to England, I sleep. Uh, uh, you know, fishing disputes, you know, wide awake uh, or migrant crisis taking place, you know, across the English Channel. I sleep, but migrant crisis from Belarus. So, you know, this has gone too far. And I think there are other narratives. The other narrative is, of course, Poland is under extreme pressure to change is uh, its laws, that its laws where they conflict with the EU are not uh, do not take uh, primary position. Right. Uh, so it would have to take uh, changes, constitutional laws. It would have to change the way it selects judges, the way judges are punished, uh, what laws are upheld. So Poland, in a way, is like there are a lot of sides here that are gaining something and losing something simultaneously. For the Poles, they're looking weak, but at the same time, they're looking like they're an important bulwark against Russia and Belarus. For the EU, uh, it's a stupid move, and they've brought this entirely upon themselves. But at the same time, it reignites after maybe a month of absence of a of another Russia is evil narrative to circulate in the news, right? So all sides have kind of something to gain and something to lose by it. Lukashenko doesn't have really much to lose at all. He's the real winner in all of this. He's forcing them to talk to him. And even if they don't talk to him, he's, they're going to have to take the migrants anyways. Now, the other winner behind the scenes, though, is Viktor Orban. Viktor Orban flew to Istanbul to meet directly with Erdogan 
And they, in a sense, he's come to the rescue of the Poles. Uh, and the Poles, are, I'm sure, have a lot of gratitude toward him for that. But it's going to um, cause the ire of the EU uh, as well. Uh, essentially, what what has happened is uh, Turkish and uh, Belera, the, the Belarusian uh, airline, have both agreed not to take any more people originating from um, Iraq, uh, from Kurdish, quote unquote, Iraq. So uh, they're changing that process as we begin, uh, as we begin this week. Uh, so a lot of this was made into a huge crisis uh, for the for media's sake. It is not a huge crisis, but. Poland now um, gets to have its moment. Uh, it, it, it can appease its its right wing sector uh, with, let's say, a show of force, a, a very permanent kind of wall that's going to be erected on its border with Belarus. It will find support amongst Baltic countries as well. Uh, it will even find some tacit uh, support from the rest of the EU, but, may, but probably not from the elites. The elites have already begun criticizing the Poles for not handling this the right way. It doesn't matter because uh, Duda and, uh, and, 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 and his government need to score points because of the pressure that they're facing from Brussels. And this, they are scoring points here. Uh, what is going to come out of it? How, you know, how long will it last? I don't know, but, um, it depends how long they can, they can drag the, the, the whole crisis, quote unquote. And, you know, that, um, that, here, here's the other thing you brought up again, the response to Poland. It, it is very interesting looking at the comparison to that, to the way that the response was to Bulgaria and Greece when they fortified their border with Turkey at the beginning of 2020 when Turkey was threatening to turn on the spigot of migration flow into Europe where mm -hmm. again there was a lot of verbal support I mean the French did end up sending a few ships but it seems like they were more or less hung out to dry whereas like Poland will get this finger wagging but at the same time it'll be like hey, look, you can prove yourself as the bastion against Russia. And it really just shows the differences on how these frontier countries get treated based on whatever the need at the moment is. Like, again, and I think there's, you know, with that, again, with the whole your skepticism question, more of that is in Poland than it is, for example, like Greece and Bulgaria. Maybe, again, Greece is in a weird situation with that. But again, just those two cases in general shows how Brussels treats the countries on the hinterlands, mm. which, I mean, this isn't going to be the last of uh, this kind of crisis. And I would say, again, the one with Turkey is bigger, and there's also potential with that to happen again and for them to do this. And, you know, the main threat's going to come from that. Lukashenko probably isn't going to continue this forever, especially as integration with Russia moves closer. But but as again you pointed out, like you know some of these mer uh, these merchant uh, merchants, uh, you know slip the tongue there. But some of these migrants were being flown from Turkey to Belarus, which again shows this uh, again yet again Lukashenko Lukashenko playing all sides with Erdogan, who also plays all sides. Match made in hell, really. Uh, but with that uh, with that being said, uh, this is also yet again another proxy with Turkey. And as you said, you had Orban going there in Poland instead in order to try to negotiate an end to this crisis. And at this point, if Europe was pragmatic, they would see that maybe if that frontier in Belarus were under Russian control, something like this might not happen. Maybe Putler wouldn't go this far, even though, again, they would try to find a way to tie it to him, as they're trying to now. But at the end of the day, they're going to can, again, like I said, not to downplay the concern of the Poles on what's happening with their border, but they're going to obfuscate this issue and walk this tightrope with Erdogan while using Lukashenko as the punching bag and Belarus as the punching bag. And it just creates this incoherence that is pretty typical of 21st century European politics, if I 
just have to give a general <laughs> statement to it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, twenty uh, first century politics is a is a good term for this kind of thing. Uh, yeah. So, um, I I would expect this to to be resolved fairly quickly. Like, I don't see it lasting for more than another week. Um, and you know, it will go into. Uh, I guess until the next one, dustbin of history. But the migrant flow, flow coming in through other avenues from North Africa, that will still go on. Like, you know, just uh, just the same way that when we went through the first few lockdowns in 2020, uh, migrants were brought into Ireland so they could work the fields because farmers weren't permitted to do so because, you know, COVID. Um, so, you know, there's these double standards it's very much in the same way that they um, they 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 claim to be against uh, authoritarian regimes, but they will always support Saudi Arabia or Israel. Um, it, it, so it's it's ridiculous. Everybody knows these the, the, these contradictions, but I suppose the way they get around it is saying, well, it's different with with Russia because uh, you know Russia too strong or. We're too dependent on uh, on Russian gas and oil, and then incidentally, you know, Ukraine has uh, also beefed up its borders, as if like any of these migrants are going to try to get to the EU through Ukraine. It's there's a very small trickle that do, but that's you know, that's Ukraine trying to be uh, in Relevant. the headlines. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but we should we should mention. Uh, did we mention on the on the show last week? Um, uh, America's CIA director flew to uh, to Moscow to meet with Putin and uh, was denied a, a, a meeting except uh, uh, a telephone call. Uh, Putin refused to see him in person, so um, the CIA director could not um, overstep his um uh, a meeting of just somebody lower down the rank somebody of a, a counterpart of his own rank uh, that didn't work and then you have uh what's his name the uh the chief of staff he, the, um the african american fellow he he went to ukraine uh, so it, basically um, there was it austin uh lloyd austin secretary of defense lloyd austin right secretary of defense sorry uh, so he paid a visit to Ukraine, and it, what it looks like is they're drumming up the possibility of another attack. The UK says it's considering uh, sending in its SAS, its special uh, units and uh, paratroopers, about 600 to Ukraine. Um, you know, they're not done. They, um, uh, they're they apparently alarmed that Russia has put 100,000 of its troops along the Ukraine border. Honestly, I don't know how many are, are really there. Uh, Peskov, uh, uh, Putin's, uh, let's say Putin's, uh, he's not a foreign minister, but he is one of his spokesmen, said, you know, essentially, we're not, but if we did, you know, so what? It's our country. We can do what we want. Um, I mean, America would have done the same thing if there was a war in, in Mexico. So they don't they don't see it the way America does or the EU. Um, so I, I think that is kind of happening in the background. Uh, it doesn't look like the Americans were very happy with the outcome of the meeting with Putin. Uh, some Russian sources say there was uh, intimidation by the Americans, but um, you know, the, the clock is ticking. And, it, and as we've said from, I think the very first show that I ever did with you, uh, time is not on America and the EU side. So they're the ones that that's why they're the ones applying the pressure. Oh, certainly. I think that is going to be a, a trend continuing forward. And yes, we are in what is it? The quarterly cycle of Russia's threatening to invade Ukraine. And I'm certain it will pan out this time. But you know, with, <laughs> with that, with that being said, it is just absurd. Now, in terms of other. Um, similar absurd claims. We have just a little bit of news about East Asia where American company, they said allies, they didn't specify which allies, would take an unspecified action to defend Taiwan against Chinese aggression. Pretty much giving a, <laughs> what would be understood to be a blanket uh, 
guarantee to the Taiwanese if China were to decide to attack and reunify the country by force. Now, again, this has been something we've been saying for years, and the threat just looks emptier and emptier the more we go on. And I would say it looks especially empty after you, the failure in Ukraine, after Afghanistan, after the failed wars in the Middle East. And I would say especially, you know, love or hate the whole Hong Kong situation, after the West really didn't do anything about <laughs> Hong Kong besides post memes about Xi Jinping being Winnie the Pooh or whatever the thing was, or, you know, like... How will he recover? Yeah, like, uh, beyond, like, just this really, like, dumb, like, no action sort of stuff, like the West not taking action on Hong Kong, I don't... There's really no reason for the Taiwanese to take these claims at face value. Again, not that I am a big supporter of Taiwan or think they should be independent. I frankly could not care less about Taiwan. I could not care less about the superconductor. In fact, I hope I hope the superconductors get destroyed. I frankly hate technology. <laughs> I don't know why I'm doing this show, but you know what? I'm in its snare. But if we the, the less superconductors, the better, in my opinion, or <laughs> you know whatever whatever Taiwan offers. And I suppose this is what happens when you're the only East Asian country with gay marriage. Uh, but you know. Yeah, <laughs> a, a country, quote unquote. But again, that's aside the point. But you you have this what seemed like under Obama and Trump this genuine pivot to Asia. Like, oh, this is where global politics are going to be enacted. Now, this is where the real important things are happening. It seems like whenever we give these guarantees to Taiwan or whatever, these just seem like formalities. It just seems like. It seems like as much as we were promised the fifth to Asia, not saying that China hasn't increased in power and that China probably, again, China is the second largest economy in the world and very good chance that those projections about it overtaking the American economy by the end of the decade are real. We'll see how that plays out. It seems like the pivot to Asia hasn't exactly happened in the way that you would have expected, where it's been more so China pivoting to the you know, pre-existing geopolitical hotspots, for example, Iran, Syria, the Middle East, um, even in Latin America, and even to some degree Europe, rather than, again, America focusing on... Of course, we have focused on creating this ring around China, including Japan, the Korean Peninsula, at least South Korea, Philippines, uh, Southeast Asia, etc. But it seems like, in terms of an America-China rivalry, it seems to be taking place actually outside of East Asia. Not saying that East Asia is relevant to this, but the pivot we were promised doesn't seem to be happening. And again, maybe that's why the threat towards Taiwan seems so much more empty, but I do have to say, as much as we've probably been led to believe the opposite, I think, not. I don't think either is likely. I think it would take a lot for, him, you know, for again, either of these to happen. I think you'd be more likely to see American forces defending Ukraine than Taiwan, and also, I will maintain that at the end of the day, I think the only country that you could generally rally an American war effort to defend at this point against an invasion would be Israel. And I think that is quickly fading, but I think that's the only thing, only country we could defend that wouldn't create massive uproar. Wouldn't create, it wouldn't be peaceful, it wouldn't be like the entire American populace behind us, but I think you could get a enough of the population to support conflict in defense of Israel's so-called borders than you could with Ukraine or Poland or Taiwan or the Korean Peninsula or any of these places. And again, just... It, I, honestly, if I, I know I'm repeating myself at this point. The threats to China in defense of Taiwan just feel like, not even empty threat, but just a formality. Just something that's expected to be done, <laughs> so it must be done. Yeah. Uh, Xi Jinping better be careful or he will be eviscerated on Twitter all over again. Um, I mean, I think the Chinese are going to play the long game. They're going to buy out Taiwan. Um, they don't, they're, you know, in the same way that uh, during July and August, people were speculating in our spheres uh, that China was going to go in uh, into Afghanistan and they're going to make big errors and they're going to like, they're going to see what it's like to get dragged down the hole just the way America and the Soviet Union did. It's like, no, they're not. Um, if if it's a no-go, they're not going to do it. Um, the thing is, is there's too many countries that benefit from trading with China, and China knows this, and China's going to go the long route. And again, 
Time is on their side. Time is not on the West side. It's not even on Japan's side. Like it or not, it's just not. China has yeah, its own issues. I mean, yeah, you want to talk about those, demographics, issues, it's like, um, yeah. Well, yeah, we're all on the Japan same boat has the there. same issues. Like, of the, they're all on the same boat. I mean, South Korea, like, literally leads them. Uh, in, in, in demographic issue problems. That's the real country that's disappearing. Uh, China has enough of a reserve population that no matter what you say about their demographics, they'll weather this. And they also have a, kind of a, a history and a government and their, their entire concept of power is such that if it gets really bad, the government will come in and they will take extreme measures, something that Japan and South Korea will never do. So that's the way I see it. Um, yeah, China's going to play the long game uh, in, in all of this. Um, let's not forget that uh, as unlikely as the EU uh, army is ever going to be, you know, van der Leyen, Borrell, all these people are talking about it. And, you know, what was uh, also Macron's reasoning? Why back, I think it was 2019, but he goes back as far as 2017 saying that, you know, we want an independent um, uh, Europe because, we, one, we can't rely on the U.S. And two, the U.S. is uh, negatively impacting our trade agreements with China. So China is very well aware of this, right? Uh, the, the divisions that are being caused in the West are coming down to how Western Europe uh, deals with America, right? Um, China doesn't have to worry about those kinds of divisions, right? It, it has a very good partner with Russia. And, um, you know, that was another thing. Oh, they'll split up any moment now. Uh, well, that's not happened. Um, so, yeah. Oh, certainly. And <laughs> again, like any problem you can point yeah, with to, to, to Russia, to Russia China. and China at the end of the day, it applies just the same to the Western world, especially when it comes to the demographic question. It's like we're all in the same boat, and, and as you pointed out, the race to the bottom is being led by far by the South Koreans. But I suppose that is a, another week wrapped up for the war report. Um, so we will see you guys next time, and goodbye. Take care.